In the name of the Father and Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We will continue our study in the book of Joel. And we said last time that the theme of the book of Joel is renewal, spiritual renewal. God wants to renew us. And last time we spoke about the problem that was happening, that all of a sudden the people, the kingdom of Judah, which is the kingdom of the south, they woke, they woke up one day and they saw locusts coming and destroying all their plants. When the locust comes and destroys all their plants, we said last time, it means that they feel that God is not happy with them because having a good harvest was a sign of a blessing from God. So now, we, the, the book of Joel, as we said last time, is divided into two parts. The first, it's only three chapters. The first chapter and a half is mainly talking about the consequence of sin and what does sin cost us. The second half is a lot about how to repent. So right now we are in the half that talks about the consequence of sin. Okay, so last time we concluded with uh, verse 3 after we give the introduction. And verse 3 we said, chapter 1 verse 3, we said that God told the people, now we're going to have to change your memories. And you have to tell your children and grandchildren and grand-grandchildren about what happened in your days. I just want to mention Keda, something simple before we go on verse 4. We are obligated to teach our children and our grandchildren what we learned about the church. Don't ever think that you're wasting your time if you spend time teaching people. Like after the liturgy is over, you can come and sit with somebody and talk to him. I remember even me personally, I, I, and I said something during one of the sermons and I had an elder uncle after the liturgy, he stayed with me and told me, Abuna, you mispronounced one word. And he was right. Better than me living all my life mispronouncing a word. He explained it to me and I was thankful for it. We have to do it with the spirit of love and gentleness. God said, you have to teach these things to all generations. Now we're going to start from verse 4, chapter 1, verse 4. So, so far, Joel has not told them what happened because all of them see what's happening. Now he's going to explain the disaster that happened. He's saying, what the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust has left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. So he's finally declaring to them the disaster that's happening. He's telling them that we had four different invasion of locusts, okay? By the way, the chewing locust, a lot of you know, scientists, they say the locust, when it's barely born, cannot really move much, can only chew. So it can cause certain destruction. And then once it starts growing, it starts walking. This is the, the, cro the swarming locust. And then once it starts having small wings, they call it the crawling walk locust. And then until it becomes a full locust that comes and destroys the plant. So he's telling them that we have four different stages of the locust that's coming and going to destroy everything. And these, by the way, are, you can think of them as different levels of sin. Yeah, and the chewing locust, you can think of it as the, when the sin is very beginning, like a thought, like a bad music I'm hearing like I'm replacing a bad word, like a lost, a lost of a relationship. A stage when people feel they can control the sin. That is the chewing locust. And then the second immediate stage is a swarming locust. St. James in 1.15 said, the desire, once it has conceived, it gives birth to a sin. So the second stage, that you will commit sexual sin, you will curse, you will get angry, and so on. And then it develops into a crawling locust. It, it develops into addiction or justification of sin. And we see this, for example, with the sin of judgment or the sin of jealousy, where it start peeping, people starting to justify their sins all the time. And then it becomes consuming. 
and becomes consuming, it means you are, yani, God forbid, you're, you die without, without getting a chance to repent. Be careful because St. Gregory the Great said something interesting. He said a lot of times we, when we get rid of one sin, we feel happy. But we don't realize that one sin has left us, but another sin is developing. If I am not in the path of repentance, and I, one sin in my life that I have always do, for example, let's say people smoke, or people have lustful thoughts. And maybe as you grow older, you stop smoking, or you stop lustful thoughts. You might say, oh, I'm doing better. But he's saying, be careful. Because sometimes you get rid of sins, because it's the natural progression of that sin. There are certain sins that are targeting certain age of people. When you're younger, there are certain sins that target you. When you get older, there are other sins that are more dominant. So he's saying, be careful, because you might be getting rid of a sin, but replacing the sin with another sin. So what he's saying is it's important for me to start walk in the path of repentance because if I only measure based on me finishing a sin and starting another one, I could be deceived. Okay? By the way, this verse has a little bit of an irony. Why? Because the animals, the locust, tends to hear the voice of God and the people don't. The locusts are moving in four different stages, coming in and destroying Judah, but people are not listening. And sometimes we all get moved by seeing little children getting affected and we hear the same things and don't get affected. In four different stages, don't be careful because they are significant. Why? When you go to the book of Daniel, you will see that in the dreams they have seen, Daniel have seen, he have seen that there are four different kingdoms that are coming to destroy Israel. So for, the number four is significant in the mind of a Jewish person. Okay? So today, the prophet is saying, look, the destruction that you see now is going to continue. The destruction you see now is going to continue. A sin after another, after another, after another. And they only point to, point you to an evil that will happen in the future. Now, from verse 5 to verse 7, he's going to talk to the drunkards, those who, get, those who, who go drink excessively. What is he telling them in verse 5? Tell them, awaken you drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you drinkers of wine. Because of the new wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth. People who drink are those people who usually drinking is their coping mechanism. When they are stressed, the only way they feel they can cope with the situation is they're going to drinking alcohol. Those who drink usually are those who benefit from the access of the land. Yani in, in, the, in the people who eat a lot, gluttonous, they eat from a lot of food. They eat a lot of food. Drunkness means they're drinking too much. And usually, by the way, in the Old Testament, when people drink, it meant the harvest with plenty. They had extra harvest. And we see this in the, in the book of Ruth. When Boaz had a great harvest, so he started to drink. So he's telling them, you who used to live off the extra harvest that you used to receive, you will the first people suffer. What does that mean? The people who are spoiled in their spiritual life, who have not learned to persevere, who have not learned to struggle, are the people who suffer the most when the, chast the chastising of God comes. 
because they have never prepared themselves they have never trained themselves a lot of people who also drunk, they turn to belittle the message of God. Since Cyril of Alexandria said, you are drunken men, arouse yourself from your cup. Why do you do such a violence to the truth? Why have you twisted the sense of the divine teachings so as to have been carried off the royal road? He's telling them, stop belittling the message of God. When COVID-19 hits and people are telling us, this is a time for repentance. This is a time for repentance. People said, oh, everybody's talking about repentance. We're overwhelmed. This is too much. I don't know what to do. People who are spoiled have not learned the path of repentance. And he's telling them, even the new wine is cut off. What does that mean, the new wine is cut off? Wine goes through different processes. You have the old wine that's fermented and the new one that you just made. He said, the new and the old no longer exist. Any person who, who is an alcoholic, he prefers the older wine because it has more alcohol and it's, I don't know, I don't know if, it, I don't know if this is better or not, but it has more alcohol inside, so they prefer it. And it's more expensive usually. And he's telling him, in the verse, he's telling him, what, it's going to be cut off from your hand. As if he's drinking and somebody comes and hits the cup. Sometime, God has to speak that way. Sometime, God has to speak that way. Where he says, look, you become indifferent for many years. And you have become arrogant with your parents. And you have become difficult to deal with. You know what? I'm going to give you a relationship that you're going to struggle with. Whether at work, whether a friend... So you can learn that not everything is easy. And you learn how badly you have been treating the people around you. Verse 6, he says, For a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the fangs of a fierce lioness. Now here he's describing the locust. He's saying the locust is so great in number, almost like a strong nation. And they're very strong, like a lioness. I think the lioness, when the, actually the, the female lion is the one who goes for hunting. So he's saying the locust that's coming is extremely aggressive. But one of the most beautiful words in this verse, he says, hey, For my nation has come up against my land. In the midst of the disaster, in the midst of sin, God still sees this as his land. Sees us as his people. If God allows the church to be closed, the destruction of churches, the jobs to be lost, he still takes ownership of us. The worst thing that God could do to us is to be indifferent toward us. St. John Chrysostom says, passion or sin destroys us. He says, excessive passion is both cruel and oppressive. So the nations, he looks at the nations that's coming to attack us, not the locusts that's attacking, but the passions that's attacking us. Oppressive and greedy, and it never ceases to devour us every day. For their teeth are the teeth of a lion, or rather even far more fierce. For a lion, as soon as he ever satisfied, wants to leave the body that has fallen but that these passions neither are satisfied nor they leave the one whom they have seized. St. John Chrysostom is saying, when a passion comes and sees you and takes control over you, they are aggressive. They could make you do a lot of mean things, a lot of evil things. By the way, the evil things you do are not only external, but internal. I could, inside my heart, destroy all the grace that God has given me because of my passion. I have a desire to be in control. I have a desire to be powerful. I have a desire to have people respect me left and right. 
all what I keep inside my heart is feelings of hatred, judging, disrespect. And that passion is destroying me inside. We do not understand how sin is the biggest preventer of God's grace in our life. Why? Because if I am an arrogant person and God gives me grace to do a lot more service, that's going to only make me a worse person. It's going to make me more arrogant. So here, we have to be aware that the, that the enemy, the devil, when he comes, he's not going to leave us. All of us, in, w in one way or another, are imprisoned to a sin. And sometimes, for example, one of the most common sins that a lot of people are imprisoned to is the sin of judgment. For example, I frame a person in a certain way. This person always motivated by self-interest. So every time he does any action, oh, again, this person again. He only does this because he only cares about himself or she only cares about herself. I'm in a prison. I cannot see the good in that person anymore. I cannot pray for that person anymore. I cannot humble myself anymore. Because I only see evil. I only see evil. Verse 7, he says, This enemy, he has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig trees. He has stripped, stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made white. God is saying that this enemy, this sin, this locust that came, have taken away all fruits that God has given us in our life. By the way, vines and fig trees, they usually grow in the same field. And they are a sign of prosperity. So if you look, for example, in 1 Kings chapter 4, 25, it says, Judah and Israel dwelt safely, each man under his vine and his fig tree, from Dan as far as Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. So actually, the Bible is saying the vine trees and the fig trees are a sign of safety and prosperity. When sin enters my life, I become anxious, I become sad, I become worried. And God is saying, you lose, you lose the blessing that I have given you. I want to tell you guys something, keep it in mind. The peace of God is so precious. It's so precious that I should not let anything steal it. Sometimes people fight over five dollars and they get into a big argument and fight and I have to take my rights or fight over somebody said a sentence or somebody acted in a small way. And they argue and they fight and they lose their peace. The peace is a great blessing that God has given us. Why should I sell it cheap? Why should I give my joy for nothing? That's what sin comes. He says it destroys everything. It destroys everything. Now in verse 8, He's going to speak to the general audience from verse 8 to verse 10. He says, lament. Now what, what are we going to do? He says, lament like a virgin girded with thick cloths for the husband of her youth. Lament like a virgin girded with, with thick cloth for a husband of her youth. Here he's addressing the whole nation. He says, the whole nation must repent. It means, be careful, that we all of us are in this together. I'm going to tell you guys something, keep it in mind. There are cert certain sins that we as a church, as a community, participate in. And we allow to happen day in and day out. It's the sin of all of us.
Okay? And St. James spoke about this in the, in the Bible. He said, when somebody comes into your assembly, why do you pay more attention to the rich and leave the poor? There are certain sins that as a community, we all might fall into. And we think it's acceptable. Here he's telling them, sackcloth, by the way, as you guys know, it's made out of camel or goat hair. And it's a sign of extreme mourning or humiliation. But I want to tell you guys something. There were two extreme or terrible examples of sorrow in the Jewish life. One, when a virgin loses the arranged marriage. Lament like a virgin. Virgin means she's not married. Girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. What does that mean? In the old days in the Jewish time, a virgin, like a, a girl, they will arrange her. When you get old, you will marry your cousin, for example. So all her life, she's living with a dream that I'm, I'm going to marry Mr. Joe when I, become, when I become old enough. That's why we say St. Mary was engaged. But at the same time, in front of everybody, she's married, right? There's a promise of marriage. So imagine, Kida, all your life, you have a husband, you're waiting to marry that person, and he dies. Now, the Jewish system, they go through ranking. And instead of marrying a young a man who fits your age, you might end up marrying an older guy who's like 60 or 80 years old when you're like 12, like St. Mary, because of the arrangement that they have. By saying lament as if you have lost the future that you're looking forward to. The second greatest mourning is when somebody loses their only son in the family as we see this in Amos 8:10 because when people lose their only son it means the chance of them to have the messiah coming from their heritage is very low is non-existent so he's telling them lament cry cry for your sins why should I cry? In verse 9, because the grain offering and the drink offering have been cut from the house of the Lord. The priest mourn who minister to the Lord. He's telling them lament because there is no longer sacrifice. The church is not open. The mourning offering, by the way, the grain offering was basically they bring flour, oil, salt, frankincense, and they offer it to God day and night. You will see it in Leviticus 2 and Amos 5. He's telling them the grain and the, the, the drink offering which used to happen every morning and every evening is no longer there. Why is that so sad? Why is that so bad? It means that God suspended his covenant with Israel. God promised to protect Israel. Now when there is no more offering, it means there is a suspension of covenant. That's why during COVID-19, you see... The church insisted on praying liturgy, even if the priest would pray it from his house. Because the Eucharist is the new covenant. And if the Eucharist stops, it's a suspension of the covenant. It's the worst thing that could happen to the church. Look back what he's saying. He says, mourn, who should mourn? The priest should mourn. Why is that significant? Because in Deuteronomy, God was telling the priest, when you go to God, you should rejoice. In Deuteronomy 6, 11, he says, you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite who is within your gates, the stranger, the fatherless, the widows who are among you at the place where the Lord your God chose to make his name abide. He's telling them when you come to God, be happy, rejoice. Now because of their sin, when they come to God, they have to lament. They have to cry. Our action affects our worship. There is no separation between my worship and my action. The day that I think there is a separation, 
the day I'm living a life of hypocrisy. The day that I pray for something and do something else, I live a life of hypocrisy. God is saying, you will change the way you worship. And you have to open your eyes because what's happening around us, God is calling us for repentance. God is calling us for repentance. Not, be careful, because a lot of things that are happening around us are not by accident. If you live this way, you will miss all the signs of God. Look at the, in Luke 13, 1 to 5, look what Jesus said. People came and told him, have you heard the news that their pilot mixed the blood of some people? What do you think of that? See what Jesus said? And Jesus answered and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such a thing? I, I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will likewise perish. So God is saying, any time you hear a news, it should motivate you to repent. We have become expert at being curious of every event that happens of us, around us. I want to get more detail. Who got engaged? Who got married? Oh, did they got divorced? Why did they do this? What happened? Why? How come? Oh, this guy is so mean. This guy is so... This girl is so... Curious about the news. Oh, somebody died. Oh, really? I didn't know. All very passive. But God said, unless you repent. He tell him the field is wasted and the, and the land mourns for the grain is ruined and the new one is dried up. The oil fails. He's telling them all the crops that Israel depends on. Grain, wine, and oil. They are destroyed. Grain, wine, and oil. What do they use them? They use them for everything. For lamps, to light up their lamps at night. They use them for hygiene, to clean. They use them for food. They use them for offering. He's telling them, your main goods that you depend on are destroyed. Why is this significant? Because when God created Adam, he made him a steward of the creation. He made him steward over the food supply. He's telling him today, that the foods are ruined because of your action. You are ruining the creation of God. In the fraction that sometimes we pray in the liturgy, we say something so beautiful. We say, the creation and the angels give thanks to you on my behalf because I am not able to give thanks to you. So even the creation that give things on my behalf, I am destroying it. Because of my sin. Because of my sin. Then from verse 11 to verse 12, he speaks to the farmers. He says, be ashamed, you farmers. Wail, you vine dressers. For what the wheat and the barley? Because the harvest of the field has perished. Tell them, you're going to look shameful in front of the Gentiles because it means that God did not bless you this year. Verse 12, he says, The vine has dried up, the fig trees has withered, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree, and the apple tree. All the trees of the field are withered. Surely joy has withered away from the Son of Men. I'm going to get to spend a few minutes on this verse because it's important. He's telling them the vine has dried up. In the book of songs, of songs it says, A fig tree forms its early fruit. The blossoming vine has spread their fragments. Arise, come, my love, my fair one, come with me. The fig tree, God put it so when people wake up in the morning, they hear the voice of God calling them, Come, my love, I love you. Now the sign of God's love is disappearing. By the way, you guys, we have to feel this when we pray. And when we pray the Thanksgiving prayer, we say, hey, let us give thanks to God. You pray this prayer alone, 
Who are you telling them, let us give thanks to God? Who is giving thanks to God with you? The angels, the creation. The whole earth is moving. Let us give thanks to God. Every time I'm praying this prayer, I feel the room is full with angels praising God with me. And he says, the pomegranate tree, look in the, which is, was very abundant in Palestine. In the book of Songs of Songs, they say, God is talking about the human soul. He's telling her, your cheeks are like halves of pomegranate, pomegranate behind your veil. Your cheeks look like what? A pomegranate. You guys know like um, when somebody kidda, gets shy, their face turns red, right? Like a pomegranate kid. God is saying almost like what? The manners that you had, people get shy because usually they have good manners. When they, they respect somebody or they talk to an elder, he said the manners are disappearing from the land. The manners are disappearing from the land. I remember when I was young and I take mess and public transportation with my dad, if I'm sitting next to him in the train or the tram or anything like that, and a, and a woman walks by or an elderly person walks by, he always tells me, get up so the other person can sit down in a crowded transportation. Manners. He's saying the manners are disappearing. The palm trees in the, in the book of songs, it says your stature is like the palm tree. You walk in an orthodox way. It's disappearing. The apple trees. He's telling her the, frag the fragrance of your breath like the apples. It means when you speak, I smell God in your words. There's an aroma of Christ. I had one of my friends one time told me, when I'm upset, I only turn on the sermon of Pope Shenouda. Just hearing his voice keeps me calm. The voice, the voice has the aroma of Christ. God is saying that you're not going to only lose the physical, the education and the health and the social and the fun activities. You will lose also the blessings, which is more important. The joy, the peace. That's what we're after. If you guys remember, St. Paul said, he said, he said, the kingdom of heaven is three things. Peace, joy, and righteousness. Peace, joy, and righteousness. And if I start using, losing these three things, I cannot enjoy the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Now, we'll, verse 13. Finally, there is a, a big shift in the, in the chapter. He's going to call people to repent. He's going to tell them, okay, now I've described to you the situation. You understand how bad it is. You see it with your own eyes. You see that it's going to spiritually destroy you. It's going to physically destroy you. Now what should we do? Verse 13, he said, Gird yourself and lament to you, priest. Wail, you minister before the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth. You who minister to my God. For the grain offering and the drink offering are withered from the house of your God. Who needs to wail first? The priests. Why? Because the priests and the servants are the people who teach people all the time. So a lot of time they, they are the reason why people don't repent. Because they forsake their own repentance. They forsake their own repentance. And when they forsake it, the teaching becomes dry. If I'm a parent, if I'm a priest, if I'm a servant, and I forsake my repentance, I just want my kids to be good without me, myself, changing? Impossible. Impossible. But then he's telling them something. I want you guys to watch this. He says, the sins you have is not going to require an easy repentance. Because we live in an era of easy repentance. I committed the sin. Could you please read the prayer before confession, before you go talk to Abuna? That's the maximum repentance we do. 
That's if we have done it. That's the maximum repentance we do if you have done it. God is saying no. If you truly want to repent, no regular repentance will do. You have to stay all night long. You have to repent. You have to cry. You have to reflect. Enough of that weak repentance that makes you leave the confession planning to go back to the sin. One of the main reasons that our spiritual life is weak is because our repentance is weak. And I asked myself that question when I was reading this passage. I said, I said when was the last time that I stay up all night asking God to help me repent over one sin? It requires a lot of work. It requires a lot of work. The goal of this repentance is to obtain the mercy of God. I no longer want to be lazy or careless or negligent. It requires me to stay all night long in front of God. Verse 14, he's telling them, consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Most likely the sin of Israel at this time was worshiping idols. He's telling them, all of you guys must go and pray a liturgy together all night long. St. Isaac the Syrian said, the body is weakened with fasting, the soul is strengthened strengthened through, through prayers. He's telling them, gather all the inhabitants, all the elders. It's almost saying, gather all your feelings, all your energies, all your actions. Gather them because you will stand in front of God to repent. I want you guys to keep in mind something. The Israelites, they fasted the wrong way. They prayed the wrong way. They had different understanding of God. But when God asked them to repent, he did not tell them, you know what, don't fast because you don't know how to fast. Or don't read the Bible because you don't know how to read the Bible. He said, no, still fast. Still read the Bible. Still come to the liturgy. But do it the right way. When people come and say, oh, fasting is, uh, is by the heart. I could have a pure heart without fasting. God said, no. You still need to fast. The four elements of Hebrew spirituality, which we have taken in Christianity. Fasting, sacred assembly, not private, is important, being present in the liturgy. Come to the house of the Lord and plead to the Lord. Plead to the Lord. And this is, by the way, a reminder to them to what happened in the book of Judges in chapter 20, verse 26. It said, then all the children of Israel, that is, all the people, went up and came to the house of the Lord and wept. They sat there before the Lord and fasted the day until the evening, and they offered a burnt offering and a peace offering before the Lord. Consecrate a fast. Can they consecrate a fast? Make the fast for God. Don't just, don't just say, I'll change my food. Consecrate the fast that means all day long my thoughts are occupied with God. There is a holy nature of fast that requires intense dedication to God. If that aspect is not there, this is the difference between a blessing and a curse. Difference between a blessing and a curse. St. Jerome said something beautiful. He said, sanctify a fast, proclaim a time of healing, so it appears that a holy fast may avail toward the cure of sin. If I fast truly, my sin will be healed. My sin will be healed. 
What is God telling us today? He's telling us something important. I am tired of fake repentance. I am tired of the repentance that we just put it on paper that I've repented. I am tired of people going to confess without even repenting, without even deciding to change, without praying, without asking help, without trying to practice what they're saying. This is not going to work. This is not going to work. It's not going to change you. It is not going to change you. God is saying, I want you to learn to spend the night to pray. I'll, I'll conclude with this. And one of the fathers was telling me about uh, a priest in Alexandria, his name is Abu Namina Skander. He was before Abu Nabshu came. And at the end of his life, I guess he was very sick, paralyzed. And he said that Abu Nalua and one of the other priests, they used to go and take some of the youth every Wednesday. And they spent all night praying together with Abu Na. When, the, when in Egypt we, they had a lot of monasteries, it was extremely common in the feast of a saint that people would come and spend all night for the saint to repent. Be careful because if our spiritual standard have weakened, the work of God in our life is weakened. One of the fathers said something interesting. When people asked him, he told, they told him, a lot of people are becoming atheists, a lot of people are leaving God, a lot of people are staying away from God. He answered and told them, what we're missing in this world is holy saints to show people the way of God. We cannot solve atheist view by discussions because people, even if you convince them, their, their conviction is not going to change. They want to see holiness. If I lower my standard, then the standard of the scripture, I will not get the results that the scripture promises. May God give us to offer true repentance and glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Right now, Kida Tony and uh, Ilaria will lead us in a song. Uh, we'll turn off the light and then we, all of us, Kida, will stand up to 